adjacent. And I would also say they're partners in adjacent sectors. So we often um, have great participation from researchers and funders as well as um, those working in adjacent sectors such as workforce development, youth development, um, K-12 through education, and, and other areas that really align with the work of community arts education, um, bringing together all of those stakeholders into conversation with the purpose of really building knowledge and new skills and also building relationships. Um, so not only do we focus on uh, sessions and topics that kind of strengthen community arts education and build capacity in the field, but really hope to have conversations that catalyze the growth and development of the field um, uh, more broadly as well. So um, we typically have over 650 uh, arts education leaders from more than 350 organizations really across the, the United States and some internationally as well. Um, again, these, the uh, core audience for the conference tends to be executive directors, program directors, trustees, faculty, and teaching artists, um, and as I said, those other stakeholders. And we really see um, great strength in bringing together all of those partners into conversation so that we're not siloing our conversations, but really working um, both within the arts education field and with our partners in other sectors um, to move the field forward. So for the past several years, we've really organized the conference along um, thematic tracks. Um, we recognize, these, the, here on your screen are examples of the tracks that um, we've designed of, uh, really last year. The, I think these are the tracks from last year's conference. These may shift and change, so the process is really to hear from you all through the session proposal process on what topics um, and areas are most um, urgent and of interest to you, as well as through a number of different um, town hall style meetings that we have in the region where the conference is being held. We recently had one in the Bay Area and one in Los Angeles with more than 120 arts education leaders um, who shared their thoughts on what areas that they wanted to focus on within the conference. We look at all of that information and really try to design several different learning arcs that you can follow throughout the conference that address different aspects of your work in community arts education. And so again, these are examples of the tracks that we looked at um, at last year's conference. And the, some of these um, may stay, and, and there's room for, for wiggle room and, and um, adaptation here as well. But this is just to give you a sense of where the conversation um, has really been focused in past conferences. So the conference program, um, the conference is November 15th through the 18th. Um, the conference hotel is located in San Francisco, but we really are thinking of this as a Bay Area conference. Um, and so on the 15th, the conference will kick off with several full-day pre-conference institutes that will actually not be in the hotel this year, that um, will be in various community sites in Oakland and the Bay Area. So we're really excited about this, um, really grounding the work in some of the community organizations that are um, in the area and, and um, really thinking about this as a Bay Area conference. So, on the 15th, we have several pre-conference institutes. These are really an opportunity for delegates to delve very deeply into um, uh, areas of interest. So in the past, we've had um, institutes on high impact uh, K through 12 partnerships, um, on creative youth development, on um, evaluation and fundraising. So they really do vary. Um, they are led by expert uh, facilitators and um, usually bring together about 50 uh, delegates per institute for a day long, roll up your sleeves, gain some tangible skills that you can take back home with you uh, work. And then the uh, conference itself uh, you know, ha has over uh, 
50 breakout sessions. So again, those breakout sessions tend to be organized along those thematic tracks um, that we looked at in the previous slide. Um, and again, the emphasis is on hands-on learning and conversation and engagement through those breaking, breakout sessions. And then one of the, the greatest takeaways from the conference are the networking opportunities. And so we do this through a host of different ways. We have our discipline roundtables, which work to connect people through um, different artistic disciplines. Those are usually a breakfast. And then this year we're going to be looking at possibly doing sort of job alike, so having executive directors connect with each other, program directors, development folks. Um, but we found that uh, folks have found it very helpful to be able to connect with folks who have the same role as them at part organizations. Then we'll have our ambassador breakfast, which is just amazing, but a chance to hear from the National Guild membership and regional and network ambassadors about some of the activities that they've provided exclusively for Guild members around the country around topics such as creative youth development, arts and education, collegiate divisional, uh, the Alana Network, the White Ally Network. Um, so we'll hear from those groups of folks, those leaders of those sessions, about what they did to engage the community arts educators around the country. Uh, of course, we have a host of special events through receptions and some off-site activities. And then on Wednesday evenings, uh, right before the actual conference proper starts, we've been doing something called a bridge event. Heather, do you want to say a little bit about that? Sure, these have been events that are actually free and open to the public, um, rooted in conversations that are really um, alive within the local community that the conference um, is within. And so we've looked at issues of cultural equity um, and a variety of topics. These are usually hosted at a community site, again, open not only to delegates to the, but to the public, and are a real chance to um, connect the conversations that are happening within the conference with um, community conversations and to have really a, an open forum or dialogue um, between those uh, arts education leaders that are traveling from all over the country to attend the conference and those that um, are right there in the local community. And then, of course, we have our Arts Education Expo, which brings together uh, quite a few vendors from around the country to showcase um, items and materials that may help your organization get ahead. And then we have our Next Level Luncheons, which are really those nuts and bolts types of sessions that work with organization representatives to sort of what can I do now to address this immediate topic. Um, some of those next levels have been around the idea of recruiting students for program, um, social media strategies on a budget. Uh, it may be something along the lines of how do I provide low-cost professional development for my staff and teaching artists. Um, so a host of different ideas that we'd love to hear from you as folks in the field, but we've also had our ear to the ground as we've had these meetings leading up to this year's conference convening. And then we have our office hours program, which is a really great opportunity for those. It's first come, first serve to meet with professionals and leaders in the field about how they can possibly do something better or do something differently um, at their organization. It may just be a fact-finding mission. It may be a chance for James to sit down with Heather and say, hey, how do things actually work at the National Guild? Um, but it's really just a chance for a one-on-one -on -one consultation about your program and being able to change the landscape for those that you serve. Then we have. And then we have what we call uh, working meetings, and really what these are chances for you and your peers to get together and really um, roll up your sleeves and, and think about um, sharing strategies for moving work forward in different areas. So within the Guild, we have several member networks. Um, Two are listed here on the slide, uh, one in creative youth development, which are organizations and programs that are intentionally integrating um, high quality arts learning um, and youth development principles. We have a network of collegiate divisional organizations, so these are programs and departments that are part of larger um, universities and colleges. Um, we have uh, 
several different, what, we have an emerging leaders network and, and a variety of different networks that are both um, bringing together affinity groups around uh, similar program types as well as organizational structures, um, job roles, even budget size. So for example, we have a network that is focused on small budget organizations with budgets less than 750000 and really giving opportunity for leaders in those affinity groups to, to share um, common challenges, strategies for success, and then also to, um, in some cases, take that work beyond the conference, whether it's within their network um, or even in advising the guild in some of its programmatic directions of how we can move work forward in some of these areas. Um, James, do you want to talk a little bit about the ongoing work of the Alana Network and now our White Allies Network as well? Sure. So this, this work falls under the umbrella of Community Arts Educators for Racial Justice or Equity. But these are really conversations that are designed and activities that are designed to sort of change the landscape of arts education. Uh, we've noticed that um, it is not the most just environment in terms of uh, the organizations that a lot of those that we serve um, are working with people of color, yet the senior leadership does not always reflect that. So how do we work collectively to change that landscape? And actually using arts and culture as a tool to make uh, this country more racially just. Another aspect of the program, and this is really primarily for local organizations, are showcases and site visits. Um, program showcases, we'd love to have students perform during the conference. Um, and so there'll be several different opportunities for your young people to be showcased and performed throughout the conference proper through plenary sessions, receptions. Uh, there might even be a few pop-up performances. And then during the conference, during the sessions, we have program showcases or case studies, opportunities for us to see exactly what you're doing. If you have an interesting model that you want to share with the community arts at community, by all means, let's hear about it. It. Uh, and then our site visits or off-site sessions in which they've come to be uh, is an opportunity for us again to get out of the hotel. We've heard over the past few years that the hotel is great, but we'd love to see the community and we'd love to see these organizations actually um, happening. So on Saturday, we will spend the majority of the day, in the past it's just been the morning, but we'll spend the majority of the day this year out in the community visiting two or three organizations and really learning about program models uh, that work and are really moving the dial and serving and working with the community. Uh, some of these are, most of these are broken up by discipline, but some of them go deeper in looking at different practices, say creative youth development or collegiate divisional or arts and education. Um, so it's really a chance for us to see this work in action and exemplary programs uh, in the Bay Area. And James, if I could just add sure. um, to the site visits, um, these really are more than facility tours. I think back if you attended the conference, you know, many years ago, they really were <coughs> more just, uh, you know, opportunities to see facilities, maybe see some programming. Um, and over the years, these site visits have continued to evolve, um, and we've seen some really creative approaches to ways that um, and these have become really uh, off-site sessions. And so from, to give you an example, if you're in the uh, Bay Area and thinking of, you know, where you might fit into the conference program, um, you know, you, uh, several years ago we were at, we brought delegates on a theater site visit to a black box theater that is doing, the theater is doing some amazing work with, uh, around parent and family engagement, um, engaging parents and families of, of, of youth in their teen programs and their teen ensemble. And the delegates actually went out to the space and you and actually were um, uh, able to participate in uh, sort of a demonstration of their story circle process and some of their um, the components of the ways that they engage parents um, in a program that where parents are actually producing original work. So they took them through a little bit of a demonstration of their process. And then, um, actually, the delegates were then were able to share different ways that they were working on parent and family engagement. And then we're actually able to see a little bit of a rehearsal and to talk to parents um, who were in that program about their experience. So it was both very hands-on, a chance for peer networking, 
and also a, a chance to actually talk to some participants too and to see a little bit of their work. So if you are in the Bay Area and you have an idea for this, I mean, these are really chances, I think, to be out of the hotel, in the community, mm -hmm. not only seeing and demonstrating some exemplary work, but also having a chance to go deeper and to talk with your peers about what they are doing similarly or differently in other areas of the country. So that, that the um, site visits have really kind of evolved into, I think, a really exciting opportunity for um, content as well. Um, and then these are these are just a few examples of topics that um, you know that we've uh, had in breakout sessions and in other ways throughout our conference. If you, um, after this webinar, I encourage you to go to the website, which is uh, communityartsed.org, and if you click on the program tab on that website. Um, there's actually a link to last year's conference program. You'll see a, a, a quick link to the 2016 conference program. And I really encourage, if you are thinking of proposing a session, to spend some time um, just looking at the examples of sessions from last year, um, not for duplication, certainly, but just to get a sense of how people, um, the topics that were explored, what might be built upon um, and developed further at this year's conference, um, and also to look at the way that people were really structuring um, their sessions. Um, and you can also, of course, see a list of the speakers that were engaged last year as well. Um, as I mentioned, we had two conference planning meetings in California recently, and so also on that program page is um, a quick download to the notes from those two meetings. And so um, also encourage you to take a look at that to get a sense of some of the topics that were top of mind for arts education leaders in the state of California. Um, I suspect there will be similarities and things that are top of mind for many of you in different parts of the country. Um, just to name a few was sort of the impact of um, the economy on arts education organizations and the communities that they serve. Uh, the, um, a lot of interest in looking at how systemic trauma and racial trauma is affecting learning and teaching and how we as arts education leaders can also um, foster sort of healthier work environments and cultures, um, especially for artists who are working on the front lines in this area. And certainly a lot of discussion around how the new administration, um, how we lead in sort of a new time for the arts, how the new administration may impact the way we um, think about our programs and the way we develop our programs, how we engage our communities, how we fundraise, and how we lead. Um, a lot of uncertainty, I think, in this time, and a lot of questions from people in those rooms in terms of the impact um, of changes in our national landscape on the way that we lead. So just uh, really encourage you to take a look at both the past conference program and those notes as fodder for an inspiration for your own session proposals. Absolutely. Thank you, Heather. And, and just want to reiterate that our overarching goal is equitable access to arts education for all. Um, this is something that we stand by, that we actively practice here at the Guild, and that I'd like to say uh, all of the organizations in the field that we're working with currently um, do so as well. I'll talk a little bit more during the presentation about how we actively work to, to do that through the conference, but um, again, equitable access to arts education for all. And just, to, just to, uh, before we go on, someone had a question of the conference website, and that'll be up on the final screen. But for those of you who may be taking notes, um, it's communityartsed.org. And if you click on the program tab, that's where you'll find that link to last year's program and to the notes from the two conference planning meetings we've had thus far. So. Um, James, I think this is me, maybe the first one. Um, so who can propose a session? Uh, one of the questions we always get is this conference only open to Guild members? So the answer is that no, this conference is open to all member, all, all arts education leaders and um, their partners. And uh, you do not have to be a Guild member to propose a session. Members do receive a, disc, a 
steep discount on registration to the conference, uh -huh. so certainly encourage you to look into that. But you do not have to be a member. Um, and we do encourage um, you to be thinking about how we can get other voices into the conversation. Um, there's been a real effort to not silo the work um, of the community arts education field and, and the leaders in the field and um, a realization that, um, you know, we, that it really um, strengthens our work and our ability to serve students and communities when we're working in concert with others. So if you are working on a program with a partner in an adjacent field or doing research uh, or working with a funder and you think that their input could be valuable to the conversation, think about um, developing a session with them or even collaborating with another community arts education organization um, to broaden the dialogue uh, and, the, um, and the voices in the room. Absolutely, and if I can just add to that a little bit, Heather, um, you may not have a session in mind or you may not actually have a topic to propose, but you know somebody who would be great um, facilitating a session. So by all means, we welcome those suggestions too. Great speakers and great topics uh, make for great sessions. <laughs> and just get them in by April 27th. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the um, proposal process is an online process, mm -hmm. so uh, you can link to that proposal form. Again, there's the website, and it'll it's boldly on the home page and probably everywhere else on the site. Um, the deadline is April 27th. And, you know, I should say that we're really proud that I believe over 70 it, what's the, it was like 75%. about 70 percent 75 75 percent of last year's conference program um, either came either were directly from the proposal process like we took your proposals and cure and plugged them in or um, worked with you to develop them further um, and 75 percent of the program came from the session proposal process again either directly um, uh, accepting a proposal and and it became a breakout session and sometimes you know there's a really great idea and we see several um, session several session proposals that kind of align and so often what we'll do is like follow up with several of you and say hey listen we have this idea of how we can bring these different elements into one breakout session um, and curate that way so we're really proud that this is this is a really um, you know, James does a great job in concert with the whole program team of really developing these ideas in concert with you and others. So also just want to encourage you to reach out to James um, as you're kicking around ideas. You know, um, he's just an amazing resource um, to really think through how to strengthen your proposal um, and to just bounce ideas off of. So we can't encourage you enough to just reach out and um, brainstorm with us because we're happy to always have those conversations and want to help you make uh, the most effective proposal that you can. Absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. So qualities of an effective proposal. Heather, you're up again. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Um, well, choose a topic relevant to a national audience. What does that mean? Um, we serve many different types of organizations. So the organizations um, represented at the conference range from community schools of the arts to arts and cultural centers to youth theaters to youth orchestras to education divisions of performing arts companies, local arts agencies, et cetera. And they are, many of them, some of them are offering only one discipline, say about half, and about half are offering many different disciplines. So there's a real um, diversity in terms of program types and settings and disciplines. And what we're looking for in, in session proposals are those cross-cutting topics, right? Things that, um, it doesn't matter if you're a dance organization or a theater organization, you need this is an effective practice mm -hmm. in your work. Um, so student recruitment, how are you recruiting students for classes? How are you engaging your community? Um, 
certainly some of those nuts and bolts topics like fundraising, um, marketing, uh, evaluation, but also things about um, uh, leadership development. You know, what are what are those transferable skills that really cut across different program types, different settings, and different disciplines? Um, Again, to reemphasize James' earlier point about networking opportunities, that doesn't mean that we don't honor the fact that it's really valuable to also get with similar program types and similar disciplines and have that kind of learning. Um, and there are opportunities for those, as, as we said earlier, network meetings and roundtables that are more specific along um, uh, affinity groups. But for these uh, larger breakout session proposals, we really are looking for those cross-cutting topics. Absolutely. And to build on that a little bit, Heather, um, those cross-cutting topics, but also something an innovative approach or something exemplary. Uh, so I understand that a lot of organizations are doing great work, but what makes your work great? Don't just tell us, show us. Um, so any data that you can bring to the table saying how you were able to move the dial or change this outcome by doing this, uh, we welcome that uh, being proposed as a session and being able to clearly describe the learning objectives, right? So if you have a group of folks in the room for 90 minutes, what's the outcome going to be? What are they going to be able to walk away with? Is this a conversation or are we going to be able to get some real tangible skills out of being in attendance to this session? Um, those things make for a really effective proposal, one that has that's that's very compelling. And, you know, when you're thinking about presenters, um, you know, certainly be thinking about who um, is really an expert. Um, and I think, you know, what's not up here is thinking about different perspectives on the topic. So that's where sometimes we can find really compelling uh, sessions where a workshop is led by um, maybe a teaching artist and um, an executive director and a researcher. You know, like what are the different points of view on this topic? Um, and really thinking about um, uh, presenters who are dynamic and um, who really know how to facilitate a strong workshop or, um, or, or if it's a presentational style, who really um, are really quite skilled at, at doing that, you know, and standing up in front of a group and keeping people engaged. Um, and I guess, yes, we have a little ha here. We do limit you <laughs> to three presenters, so you have to be judicious in sort of who you reach out to. Um, we have had, you know, to, to James' earlier point, we have had um, people who have said, you know, this is something I'm really interested in and that I, that I feel my organization or I am doing good work in and, and have said to us, like, if this is an idea that you are interested in pursuing, I would be happy for you to help introduce me to some other people I might be able to work with on this topic. So I think we're open to that too if you just I indicate that in your session description or even reach out to James or I ahead of time and say, I'd really like to do this, but I don't want it to just be about my organization or my program. How might I flesh this out further? Who might I reach out to to do this with me? We're happy to be thought partners on that as well. Um, and Gotta love a good acronym, but um, and we know a few, but when you can uh, try to limit the acronyms, um, because it's not James and I that are only reviewing these, and we'll get into this in a minute, but we do um, have a peer review process, and not everyone is familiar with the same jargon or acronym. So try to limit those and really just uh, speak clearly and um, simply about what I think, you know, what you're going to address and what your program is about. So one of the things that we also encourage is um, maximum engagement uh, with those who are in attendance. So while we love panels, I think that you can do a panel and then some. Um, so we found that the sessions that get sort of the most traction are those that are workshops that really work with the audience um, and that allow time for a Q&A or have people working together and sort of sharing their experience, those actual session participants being able to dig into one of the ideas or topics that was introduced by the facilitator 
and and then being able to do a share back with the rest of the group so if you do have a panel idea I would say that's okay but we also want you to make sure that you build some time in there maybe you go back and you have people discuss what the panel talked about and and you share as a group um, so really making sure that you maximize the engagement and participation of those um, in the session we've had sessions uh, a maker session I remember a couple years ago and where an organization was talking about how they created a maker lab and they actually brought in materials for folks to not only hear about what they've done and how they did it but to actually do it um, and they were able to make these really cool light-up pins and um, we knew that <laughs> folks went to that session because they were walking around the, the conference grounds with these light-up pins so anything that gets people up out of their chairs and moving uh, is always welcome and effective handouts uh, we also we provide an area that you can upload handouts that you've used and also if you've done your presentation before and it happens to be online send us a link to it or put that in the session description we'd love to check it out but uh, anytime that somebody can come out of a session with handouts or direct links to a PDF of resource materials um, that always sort of it reinforces the learning of course but it helps them when they go back to to their organization sort of in the grind and, and in the hustle and bustle of the day they're able to revisit these ideas that were presented to them during the conference for community arts education Heather it sounds like yeah. I just add one thing um, it's I guess a long engagement but one of the uh, what I'm thinking sitting here thinking one of the um, uh, audiences or delegate groups that we didn't mention and that has actually become well two actually that have become have a growing presence at our conference one are teaching artists um, and so we do offer some need-based financial aid for teaching artists and um, we'll have information up on our website about that but we really feel like it's important that teaching artists be part of these conversations and sometimes are you know lead some of the best sessions so um, really thinking about how you might engage your teaching artists in the conference and then also um, young people so last year we were able to support eight young people from around the country to to participate in the conference both as delegates and in some case session presenters mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of there's continued feedback from the field that they want more of that um, we've had some very strong sessions where alumni from programs have come back and presented um, as part of a session. Um, and so I think we are very interested in, in sessions that incorporate youth voice and leadership um, in a meaningful way and welcome any ideas that you have um, for engaging more young people in um, the sessions as well as as delegates um, in the conference as a whole. Absolutely. <clears throat> so the session proposal review and notification. Um, a little correction here. I just want to let folks know the actual deadline is April 26th. That is a Friday. April 27th is a Saturday. And unfortunately, we do not work on Saturday in many cases. Um, so April 26th is the <laughs> session proposal um, deadline. We'll let you know by August 4th, and many times it will be much, much earlier. Uh, but an absolute drop dead deadline of us contacting you will be August 4th. Um, Heather spoke to this a little bit earlier, but the session review process is not done just by um, Heather and myself and those at the Guild. This is done by, by, by you by people in the field who are doing this work, um, experts in sort of each one of these um, content categories, but then also the guild steering committees and networks. We have a, the Collegiate Divisional Network, our Alana Network, where we review social justice sessions or social justice focused sessions. The Creative Youth Development Network, we review sessions that deal with creative youth development. Um, some of our larger school networks will really dig into those large school type sessions or some of those operations um, sessions. So just be mindful that it's not Heather and I making all of the decisions. Um, it is the field. And if your session is not accepted, we, we love to offer feedback as to what can make your proposal stronger so that you can come back next year. And then if your session's not accepted as is, we will work with you in many cases to connect you with somebody who we think may help you make a stronger session or, hey, this person proposed that. Why don't you two join, uh, join forces and become the Wonder Twins? Um, but just different ways on, on how to engage and, and think about creating your argument for, for why you want to be a part of the, the conference here. 
And James, if I might okay. give one example of how a session was curated um, out of this proposal process. We did a standing room only session last year on five effective models of creative youth development practice. Um, it was a TED Talk style session, so there was a facilitator, and then there were five presenters, um, many of them presented with alumni from their programs, but five different presentations that were only 10 minutes apiece. And they were very kind of TED Talk style, um, and they, each of those five presentations, those models, came from five individual session proposals. And we, when we brought the, um, the different creative youth development session proposals to the review panel, you know, everyone was like, oh gosh, these are all so great. You know, I wish there was a session where people could just really get a sense of what this work is by looking at different models. And then a light bulb went off where we're like, well, we could maybe do that. How would we do that in a really dynamic way? And, and it was developed with those presenters. Um, through a couple of different planning meetings and got off the chart remarks. So everyone, you know, I just, I use that as an example because um, those models came from the proposal um, process. The panel looked at them all, felt they were all strong and really helped to guide us in thinking about how to curate a session where delegates could really learn from all of those different models. And so, um, so that is an example of, of, of one of the ways that happens. Absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Then and registration policies. This is really straightforward. Um, all of our presenters or panelists must register for the conference uh, by the registration deadline. Um, all of those who are speakers for the conference are eligible for a speaker discount. Um, and we have not solidified what that will be exactly this year, but keep a lookout on our website and we'll let you know. And then sometimes when you do bring in external partners, this has happened uh, for several sessions. Say you have um, two folks from, from different fields who are just coming in for the day to help with the session, we're happy to waive, um, waive those conference registration fees um, as long as they're just there for that session. Uh, and that's, you know, open communication, just letting us know who's who and what's what, and we're happy to do that. Registration for the conference opens usually uh, early to mid-July, and uh, all of this, this will be on, our, on the Guild registration uh, page for a conference. So other opportunities for involvement, if you are not presenting a session, um, Sheena Yoon, who is our program coordinator here at the Guild, manages our volunteer and work study program. Uh, this program is amazing. Um, it's an opportunity for you to attend the full conference or a full day of the conference if you're volunteering. Uh, we likely will accept uh, probably about 30 volunteers for this year's program. We only accept full-time volunteers, meaning that you're either going to volunteer for the full conference or a full day of the conference. Um, and usually that's about uh, 9 to 4 35 o'clock 9 a.m. to 4 35 p.m. Um, and doing that volunteer work you may serve as an usher in many cases most of the volunteer opportunities are serving as a session moderator in which you'll take notes and administer a session evaluation survey at the end of the session but just a really great way to take advantage of every single aspect of the conference program you are a delegate you have credentials um, but you're working the conference, and it's a great way for you to connect with other volunteers from around the country as well, and in addition to work with the amazing National Guild staff. And then we have our networking meetings. Um, so you may not want to propose a session, but you may have an idea that you want to facilitate a conversation about. So that's what happens during our networking meetings. Please propose those, and this is a great way to get involved in the conference program too. Uh, if you have any questions, I cannot encourage you or tell you enough, please contact myself or Heather Eichmeyer. Her email address is Heather Eichmeyer at nationalguild.org. And we are more than willing to, to talk through a proposal or connect you with folks who are doing this work around the country. Maybe you can, again, you know, pool your resources and, and become the Wonder Twins. Um, <laughs> Heather, at this time, we would like to, to open the lines and welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, I know we've thrown a lot at you in terms of how to propose a session, but if there are any questions, uh, please, please, now is the time. And if you're just joining us, the question uh, 
just want to type your question in the chat box, yeah. and then we'll see it pop up. And if there are no questions, um, we can let you guys go on your way for your day, and certainly you know follow up with us after the webinar um, as ideas begin to percolate. Okay. One thing I will say is that we usually receive about, I'd say, 120, uh, 130 session proposals a year. And of that, Heather and I will do a first pass and read through things. Sometimes a session may be too discipline specific, so we'll have a session that's proposed uh, how to create affordable music lessons. And then we'll talk to the, the person who presented that session, well, is this about creating affordable music lessons or is this creating affordable programming? So if we're able to do that slight reframe on the session proposal, and we really think it has some weight, then we'll work with you to get it programmed. Otherwise, if it's too specific um, or too narrow of a focus, uh, unfortunately, it won't be able to be accepted by the panel. And um, just one other thought about the, uh, I think we mentioned this briefly, but just to clarify. So um, again, it is not James and I really doing the review. These are panels of peers that review um, from different disciplines, different areas of the country, different perspectives on the work. Mm -hmm. um, we try to look at how you are um, identifying your own session. So we ask you to say, OK, I think this is leadership development or social justice or a combination. And then we have, like I said, several um, member networks with steering committees that have expertise in some of those areas. Um, so they review um, the session proposals that align with their um, with their area of expertise. And then for some of the more general ones around nonprofit management and other areas, we um, we put together a, a a, another panel to look at the ones that don't align with the, the member network, so the topics that are um, identified in the proposal itself. So um, again, these are really carefully reviewed, and it is not a yay or nay review process. It's really a feedback process that then um, James and I and the, the program team can take that those recommendations and begin to shape things. And then I'll keep adding to this, but uh, another way to think about this is that, so yes, we do have this national convening that will happen the 15th through the 18th in November, but these sessions have longevity. Uh, we're working with several of our conference presenters from 2016 to program some of these sessions throughout the year uh, because we found that you know people get really bummed, hey, I want to go to this session, I want to go to that session, but they can only choose one. So some of the more popular sessions will be programmed as a webinar throughout the year. So they will live on. Uh, we just had a great question come in from Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Um, is there a number of sessions that you can propose? Absolutely not. Uh, Please know that we will likely only accept one, um, and that would be the strongest one. We had this happen last year uh, with a couple folks, but there is no limit to the number of sessions that you can propose. And sometimes we've actually had instances where people propose two sessions, and we say, oh my gosh, what if you um, integrated the second into the first in this way, or we'll have a conversation about that. So sometimes it's um, there's some um, the ways of sort of thinking through how different elements of both of the proposals may actually work together as one session, one breakout session, and that's happened in the past as well. So, so yes, let the ideas flow. We we really want to hear um, all of them. Yeah. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, do you see anything else coming in, Heather? No, I just want to thank all of you for making time out of your day to learn more, and please keep the conversation open. We want this com conference to be relevant and dynamic and really adjust addressing sort of the urgent issues that you are facing day in and day out, um, and be creative. So thank yes. you for spending the time, and uh, please stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And just a reminder, this program comes from you. So the strength of the conference program is all determined by what you propose. Um, happy proposing, and we look forward to hearing from you. Have a good one.